Hello, I'm Maria Hall Brown, and this is LA Currents. Well, he was sworn in in December of 2020, promising bold reform. And today we're going to check in on how things are going. I'm delighted to be joined by District Attorney George Gascon. Hello, nice Maria. to have you here. Maria, so good to see you. Thank you. We blinked, and 2020 became 2023 on the cusp of 2024. Um, so much has gone on in that period of time, obviously a pandemic pandemic, et cetera, but things that have happened in your office. You just put out a midterm report for this year and you outlined several key areas and outcomes. What do you consider to be the highlights of that report? I think the highlights of the report as we look in totality is the fact that we have implemented a tremendous amount of reform in a very short period of time and we're seeing crime beginning to go back down to pre-pandemic periods. You know, during the time when I uh, was sworn in, we were in the middle of the pandemic and nationally, you know, we had so much displacement that was impacting our public health, certainly our criminal justice system. And we saw a, a, an increase in crime throughout the nation. And unfortunately it coincided with my being sworn in and the implementation of a lot of this reform. And there was an immediate reaction that somehow the, the steps that we were taking in the office were connected to that increase. And unfortunately, because politics are so integral to the process, people were not necessarily looking at what was going on around the country. Right. And every time we tried to say, well, yeah, you know, we're having some increases, but there, in many, ta in many cases, are actually less than what is going on in other places. That, that voice, th that was really sort of drown, right? There was the, you know, the, the issues that were occurring and continue to occur. And what we see now is we see sort of coming out of the pandemic and, you know, clearly COVID is still alive, but, you know, not what it was. Uh, we're seeing crime, you know, dropping, you know, uh, at a good rate. And, and again, in LA County, we're seeing it dropping at, at even larger rates in other locations where we haven't had the same uh, implementation, the same policy. So it's very rewarding for me to, to affirm the fact that we said from the very beginning that you know public safety and reform actually travel together and they can be complementary to one another. So that for me has been sort of the, the, the big takeaway as I, as I said, we're moving from 23 into 24. When you consider that we have done so much in such a short period of time, you know, our filing rates for, for violent offenses continue to be at the same rate that has been for years in the office, both for the serious and for the misdemeanors. But we have also taken bold steps to stop using the death penalty. We have been very conscious about reducing uh, the consequences for young people, you know, kids, make sure that kids get treated like kids as opposed to treated like adults like we did before. We have really addressed the issue of police accountability in a thoughtful way supporting police when they're doing their job, which is very difficult, but also holding police accountable when it's necessary. Holding ourselves accountable, our discovery obligations, playing by the rules, uh, you know, the resentencing process, uh, you know, uh, finding people factually innocent that have been in prison for, for decades where the office refused to look back at them and now saying, you know, you have people that are, have been in prison for a very long time that actually were not the people that committed the crime. Uh, the implementation of restorative justice models with kids, very victim center. Um, the, the transparency, you know, the, the fact that we're putting more and more data every day in our website. So being able to actually show the trajectory of our work. At the same time, understanding and, and being true to the fact that we understand that mental health and substance dependence are things that should not be criminalized when there is a way to get around that. Uh, holding people accountable when they're harming others, but also understanding that a concrete box is not the place to deal with mental health. So you put all this stuff that was done in such a short period of time, and now seeing crime going back to pre-pandemic period, which really illustrates that what we were doing before was not necessarily making us any safer, I think is incredibly rewarding for me and, and it's an affirmation that we're on the right path. Trying to change the trajectory of one life has caused uncalculable harm to others. So what safeguards are you putting in to understand the difference between who should be released 
and who shouldn't be released? Because frankly, that's a huge focus on the on the office at large. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think it's important to recognize that that in the in our business, mistakes are made every day. Sure. Right. I mean, we have a recidivism rate that is somewhere around seventy percent system wide, and I'm not talking about LA District Attorney's Office. I'm talking about as a nation, right? So every time that somebody reoffends after the system touch them, it's a failure, right? So it's really important to understand that unfortunately we deal with, number one, we deal with human beings, which, uh, you know, predicting behavior from human beings is often, is, is hard. And, and we come from a place of a tremendous amount of imperfection, right? So I think it's, it, it, the baseline is a baseline of imperfection, right? Not a baseline of perfection. Uh, but when we do a case and when we go back and say, you know, this could have been done better, some of the things that we do immediately is we actually are very introspective. We look at every step of the way, which is something that was not done before. You know, we take the time to really understand how can we do better moving forward. Uh, we've implemented, you know, a very good system about appealing. For instance, when one of our attorneys wants to seek uh, a, a deviation from the policies that we promulgated at the very beginning, we have put a really good solid process to do that review to allow not only our people but also the defense and others and the victims to have input into that process. Uh, we continuously look at the things that are working and the things that are not working. You know, we implemented, for instance, electronic filing. You know, before I came into office, we had, uh, because we're such a large county, you know, we had different branches doing their own filing of crimes, and you know, you could have uh, two people, you know, almost identically situated, one in Pomona, let's say, and one in downtown LA, same crime, same set of circumstances, one could be facing prison, the other one could be facing probation. We centralized the process to provide uniformity. At the beginning, you know, we had some police departments that did not have the technical capacity oh, wow. to do this, right? So we had to work through that. But today, now I'm, I'm you know, uh, you know, thankful to say we we're countywide. So this is constant process. You know, we uh, look at areas where we can do better and how we interact with the police. You know, we we realized that there were areas that were training for police detectives was important. We provided that. We look at areas where we needed training for our own people because we were missing an area that we needed to do better. We're doing that as well. So th the process is a process of continuously assessing and continuously looking for ways of improving, but, but recognizing that we we've, have never been perfect, we never will be, but the goal is to reduce the imperfections. So how is that arena of, co of cooperation going? You know, because even in a pandemic setting, any kind of communication between any governmental entities or any kind of leadership, you know, had its restrictions, had its issues. But how are things going now with the district attorney's office and other major players? You yeah. mentioned law enforcement, et cetera. Right. So, you know, I, I would say that certainly uh, from what I see, it's you know, tremendously better than it was during the pandemic. And to the point that you make, Maria, you know, communication was not easy when you're dealing remotely. You're dealing with uh, not only dealing perhaps with digital communication, but, you know, quite frankly, no communication at all, right? I mean, we had people getting sick, you know, people not being available. Um, one of the things that I have done is we, we understand the importance of a very close relationship with law enforcement partners when it comes to investigating cases. Uh, we brought in a couple of former chiefs of police into the office to play the, the role of our law enforcement liaison and the work is continuously working with the 40 plus agencies that we have in the county. Because a lot of people think, oh, you're LAPD, LA County Sheriff. Clearly those are the major agencies. But we have 44 other agencies that we deal with regularly and often they don't have the resources. So we're actually providing support. We have created a roving team of investigators that go out and help police agencies when they are unable to deal with a particular crime pattern because they don't have the resources. You know, very recently we spent a lot of time in Whittier, for instance, going after someone that kidnapped, raped, and murdered a young woman. And, and our team worked very closely with the Whittier Police Department and we were able to resolve that case very quickly. We work with the Pomona Police Department regularly dealing with uh, illegal gambling houses. We have worked with other agencies around the country doing work to, so, to supplement their capacity. 
we have put a crime analyst to work with the analysts of the police departments to make sure that we understand when pattern crimes are coming uh, our way so we're not looking at it as a single incident when in fact it may be related to other criminal behavior that may be happening in different jurisdictions because you know we're sort of the hub right mm -hmm. uh, you know everybody at the end comes to us right so having that visibility has been incredibly helpful uh, as the uh, as we saw the increase in follow home robberies a couple of years ago, we worked very closely with the LAPD. Uh, we put a, a, a you know, we, we, we created a single point of entry for those cases to come in, and, you know, that problem has evaded. Now we have the organized retail theft. I was going to jump right in and, on that. You know, LAPD put, a, put together a task force, we're part of it, but more importantly, I started working also with retail organizations, we're working with community, and we're basically looking at it, let's say, kind of a three-legged stool. One is arrest and prosecution, which we are aggressively working on. The other one is looking for potential legislative fixes to some of the areas that we need to polish. But we're also working with, with the industry to look for ways to impact their business practices and looking at the models that work better than others. You know, very recently, for instance, we became aware that the CEO of Best Buy said publicly that his inventory shrinkage. And by the way, in the retail business, they don't talk about just shoplifting. They, they, everything goes under the umbrella of shrinkage, which could be shoplifting, employee theft, or just bad accounting. And Best Buy is one of the few major uh, retail operations that actually the CEO says, you know, our inventory shrinkage has remained constant for the last few years. And then he goes on to explain why that is. And he talks about the things that they're doing, like putting uh, you know, security, at, they have a single point of entry, single point of exit at the store. They have security at the front, security at the exit. They have people on the floor greeting, talking to customers. They have removed some of the automated checkout process to make sure that people have to go and see a person. So again, it may not work for every retailer, but certainly one retailer has shown that there are ways to actually address some of this. So there, there are many things that we're engaged in in this a continuous evolution of our work. Well, even in those smash and grab situations, though, there have been mom and pop or, uh, retail, or, or they've been small, or they've been elite, uh, you know, high-end lifestyle, uh, you know, were those opportunities that maybe Best Buy doesn't have. And this is completely off what I wanted to ask you, but, you know, what do you suggest to those, um, because can they protect their own property? How can they protect yeah. their property? Yeah. Where's the law side on their security versus well first of all you know we're prosecuting the cases right so the sure. task force has now uh, brought over 20 cases to us uh, the attorney general is prosecuting two or three cases okay. we're prosecuting the other 17 uh, we have you know been, become very creative about the way we charge the cases looking for conspiracy charges and other things to make sure that we up the consequences for those that are involved in in what is organized crime um, the solutions in terms of how to harden the target from the retailer's point of view is going to be very different from the mom and pop operation that it will for a Best Buy, right? So we're working with experts, we're, you know, we're talking to people that actually understand the industry deeply because there are different business practices. You know, we're seeing, for instance, Nike stores where they're grabbing a bunch of, you know, uh, shoes. And, and I made a comment to somebody and they said, oh, that's interesting. You know, I remember when I was in college after I got out of the Army, I was a part-time shoe salesperson for a while. You know, we had the display, but when you wanted to actually you try to a shoe, you had to size. ask for it, right? And I would bring it out. So, number one, I, I would never bring out ten pairs of shoes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but number two, it was there was a hand-to-hand -hand, uh, transaction that I think it, it provided a better, I believe, a better customer experience. But also, it, it inhibited the opportunity for somebody to walk out even with a single pair of shoes, right? Now, that business model may not work for Nike, and we understand that. We also have technological capacities that we did not have when I was a young person going to college. So it's really exploring the entire universe of options and bringing people that do this every day, both the retailers and people in security, to brainstorm what are the best ways to deal depending on your situation. And does your office help? I mean, is that part of the... Uh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. We're actually, we're, we're actually in conversations doing just that. Cool. Um, back to our original, my original question and your original answer. Um, handling cases that should not go to jail slash prison, um, especially when it comes to addiction or self-imposed harm. How are the opportunities 
pre presenting themselves for alternate you know, therapy, for alternate help. Yeah. How is that policy and process? Are there alternates being put in place and are they going in fast enough for the amount of people that need that help? So the, the second part of your question, are there enough, fast enough? The answer to that is no. Are there different uh, avenues that we're exploring and that we're putting to work? The answer to that is yes. We're working very closely with all the stakeholders, including law enforcement as well as community-based organizations and our board of supervisors to increase the capacity to provide for the intervention uh, that is appropriate for people that have mental health issues, substance dependence, a combination of two. Uh, we continue to be challenged, of course, with the, the not sufficient resources, right? Uh, so much of what we deal with uh, is impacted by mental health. You know, if you talk to anyone, would tell you that easily at least 40% of the people that are in county jail every day have some level of mental health problems, some of them very acute. And often our prosecutors are faced with really uh, poor options, right? We have somebody that cannot be released on the street because they may be dangerous at that moment or they have other issues. Um, we recognize that they have a mental health problem. The best place for them would be a treatment facility that has, you know, uh, a, that is a secure facility, but we don't have ability for that sometimes, and then we end up sending the person to jail. It compounds the problem, though, because not only is the jail not the place to deal with this problem, but then we also are facing a jail overcrowding problem, right? So the sheriff, on the other hand, is facing the reality that he has to release people, sometimes even if he may not want to, because we're over capacity every single day. So it becomes a, a, a you know, a, the tension between how to deal with the, the concern for safety which we all share, how to treat people humanely, how to find the right spot for people. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's still a very delicate dance uh, that we're all working in. And you know, we're doing this all in the faith also of dealing with lawsuits concerning bail. Uh, you know, the people often misunderstand how bail works. For instance, I am against cash bail, and I have said that openly over and over again, because I don't believe that how much money you have in the bank account should matter to whether you're gonna be kept in custody or not. It should be your level of dangerousness. But the reality is that at the end of the day, all that is irrelevant because the people that set bail in our system are judges. Every year, Superior Court, all 58 counties have their own Superior Court, they set a bail schedule for the year. And basically is, if you commit this offense, this is how much bail you're gonna have or no bail. And then the police departments are required to follow that process. And then on top of that, you add the overcrowding in our jail where the sheriff is often forced to release people early because he doesn't have the space, right? So the complexity of this dance is, you know, you have many stakeholders um, that you're working with. And then this county also has what is somewhat unique to us in many ways. We have 10 city attorneys in the county. They handle misdemeanor prosecution. So if you look at the whole county, we have 10 million people. Half of our population, when it comes to misdemeanor crimes, they're prosecuted by city attorneys. So the city attorneys in LA, for instance, you know, which is almost 4 million people, 40% of our county population, all misdemeanor offenses in the city of LA are prosecuted by the city attorney. So when people say, for instance, you know, a person's blocking the sidewalk or they're committing low-level vandalism or assault, if it's in the city of LA, those cases are not coming to me, right? Uh, Long Beach, Pasadena, uh, Santa Monica, Torrance, you know, there, there, there are 10 other cities that have their own. And yet we have other parts of the county where we do, right? So finding coherence in how this, you know, this different prosecutorial agencies work together is critically important. It is remarkably complex based on everything that you just said, but also based on all those shifting lines in the sand. I mean, zero bail because, you know, the ability for someone to be able to pay bail should not be a question. However, if they're if they they created or they conducted a crime that required bail, that's telling you something. So you've got to figure out where that line in the sand is. Your your point about um, not charging a juvenile as an adult, but it was normally the level of crime that determined whether a juvenile would be charged as an adult in his previous history. So you know all these shifting sand, all these shifting lines in the sand. Um, your issue with the different agencies and who has different um, policies, et cetera. 
have you learned that you need to be tolerant and flexible in these or are you feeling as if you need to be stronger and more determined in your um, policy? Yeah, so I'm going to answer that because that's a really answer, a really easy answer. Uh, not only, it's not even an issue of tolerance, it's the reality that flexibility is key to our work right. and every case stands on their own and we do that. But going back to bail, for instance, you use the term zero bail, which I know I hear that. Sorry, and you have to forgive no, my. No, but it's important. I'm actually glad that you did because that term is used so often and it's really not an accurate term. Number one, again, let's go back to the beginning, courts, not the prosecutors determine bail. Secondly, the Supreme Court has said that for nonviolent, non-serious offenses, a person should not be held behind because they cannot afford the bail, which right. forces the courts and the system to ensure that whatever bail is set is affordable. But more importantly, and the point that I think it needs to be made here, when somebody is harming the community and where they're dangerous, they should be held back in pretrial confinement, but not because the bail but because we can say we can have preventative detention and we're going to hold you back because you're dangerous. And then, even if you have all the money in the world, you don't get to get out. I'll give you a perfect example. During the follow-home robberies, we had a gentleman that posted a total of $500,000 in bail on four different cases. He continued to be let out on bail, not on a zero bail because it was a violent crime. He continued to commit the crimes and the fourth time around, he actually murders someone, okay? This is a person that we argue that should have been held without bail, right? We still have a mindset that the only time that you can hold somebody without bail is like, you know, as a, as a mass murderer, right, or something like that. It, it, it doesn't have to get to that level, right? And I know this may not be popular with some people, but there are some people, especially, I'll give you a for instance. If you commit a crime, right, and you get released, on either no bail or some bail or whatever the case is. But while you have your case open, right, while you're waiting for your day in court, you go back and commit another crime, as far as I'm concerned, you, you should not you, get out, no. right? It doesn't matter whether you have the money to post bail or not. You now have shown that we gave you an opportunity to get out and you went back out and reoffended again. Now you gotta stay in the penalty box until you face consequences in a courthouse, mm -hmm. right? So it's doing that kind of work and understanding that the solutions may be different than what we had in the past, but the outcomes might be much better actually if we understand it's not an issue of how much cash you have, but it's an issue are you dangerous or not, are you likely to come back or not. Another thing is, you know, we have tried and the courts are doing this now. We know that for instance having people show back in court, sometimes a simple thing like a text message reminding a person you have court tomorrow. Oh. It's enough to lower the number of people that don't show up, right? So, and co-monitor, you know, there are many, many tools that you can bring to the table, but if you're dangerous or unlikely to show up, you need to be held back until we resolve the situation. Right. And money should not be the predicate. And, and let's go to the, the juvenile um, sentencing right. and that the, a juvenile should stay in juvenile court despite the level of his crime. Yeah, crime. so, I mean, this is really an area where it's really important to understand the science and understand the effectiveness of our work, right? 95% of the people that we send to prison or jail are coming back out. When you take a 15, 16 year old and you put them in a, in a jail setting, generally, when they come out, back out, and generally they come back out, you know, they're still very young and strong, they don't do much better. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that we understand that, you know, the human brain is not fully developed until we're into our mid-20s. And I jokingly say that when it comes to guys until we're in our 50s. But I'll agree with you there. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> but, but the point is understanding what the right level of intervention, and that's not to say that a juvenile will never be tried as an adult, and we have done some, but that should not be the rule. That should be the exception, and that should be driven by a whole host of considerations not simply the crime, but you know the state of mind of the individual, level of maturity, the you know the circumstances around the case, 
There are many things that play a role in that. Where are we with the juvenile detention system? Has there been inroads to be able to improve that so that when you do make those decisions and you put those individuals into the juvenile detention system because of the crimes that they have committed, are we creating a better human or are we just holding a person and letting them go and see what happens next? We have a severe problem with our juvenile probation and we have seen the, you know, some people are calling it gladiator school, right? I mean, the way that kids are being thrown into a setting, uh, poor supervision, you know, just lack of resources, uh, very little rehabilitation. Um, you know, we're, we are at a crisis moment in the county. Uh, the governor made a decision a few years ago that the state was no longer going to be in the business of holding uh, juveniles that were serious offenders in the state system. Uh, and the concept was a good concept, but bring it back to a community-based uh, treatment and, and, uh, and custody. Unfortunately, because of often political bickering, quite frankly, about not in my backyard, you know, where do you put the center, how do you build it, uh, we now are here. Uh, these kids have stayed now has basically released everybody back to the counties. Some of these kids have severe problems, and they committed very serious crimes. And we are really uh, at a crisis mode now. I have to say that, by and large, the Board of Supervisors are working really hard trying to correct this. But this is trying to fix a flat tire while the car is going 100 miles an hour downhill. Yeah, so we've witnessed that with mental health. Right. Um, are you a different man sitting here with me now than you were when you took the oath on December 8th? You know, Maria, I don't know if you remember this, but... I think I mentioned the fact that I continue to evolve every day. I talked about my own evolution, and I am definitely a different person today than I was two years ago. And I would hope that when you and I get together a year from now, that I would be a different person today. And here's what I mean by that. I don't, I'm not talking about principles and your basic ethical compass. I think that that, in my opinion, needs to be very well centered, and it should be constant. But I believe that it's a hallmark of a good human being to continue to learn, to be reflective, to learn from past mistakes, to seek new information. And clearly, I have done a great deal of growth and learning in the last two years, and I would hope that it will be the case a year from now as well. So if people want to find out about this work and get to know you more and get to know your office better and understand what issues and policies are active and being done by your office, best place? Best place is our website, you know, L.A. County District Attorney dot com or dot, dot gov, I'm sorry. Yes, they all changed to dot yeah, gov. Yeah, 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 dot gov. And, you know, it's uh, very easy. Very, in fact, if you just Google Los Angeles District Attorney, you're going to see our website will pop up. You'll see all of our policies. Also you're increasingly seeing our dashboards that actually show the number of cases that are being filed, the cases that are being presented by the police, what the conviction is rate. So we're seeing, we're putting more and more information out there. So I encourage people to go there and take a look. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking this precious time. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you back. Maria, my pleasure. I look forward to next year. <laughs> thank you. Take care. And that's a wrap on this LA Currents. <laughs>